Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My guest on this episode of Hidden Forces is Matt Taibbi. Matt was last on the show about two years ago, and our conversation focused mainly on the news media, how the press covers politics and power, and how propaganda works in a democratic society. It was a great episode. Check it out after today's recording if you're interested. Many of you will already know Matt by reputation. He's one of the most outspoken, no-holds-barred journalists that you will find anywhere, and a precious rarity during a time where many prominent journalists and political commentators seem to prioritize servile flattery and compliance above any commitment to telling the truth. Matt is also a contributing editor for Rolling Stone and winner of the 2008 National Magazine Award for columns and commentary. He co-hosts the Useful Idiots podcast alongside Katie Halper, publishes a regular newsletter on Substack, which I strongly recommend you all subscribe to, and is the author of 10 books, the latest of which is Hate INC, which we discussed during our last conversation together on episode 78. We are living through what I would describe conservatively as a very dangerous time. Everyone's on edge because unsurprisingly, days after the election was supposed to be over, We still don't know who the president is, and technically, we may not know until Inauguration Day. What's most remarkable, though, about the shit show that this election is turning into is how predictable it was. I've watched panels and been on conference calls at think tanks dealing with how to manage voting irregularities, large numbers of mail-in ballots, and just about any other issue you can imagine, and yet somehow we still managed to screw it up. How can you not entertain conspiracies when you're faced with explanations that demand such incompetence? It's one of the many questions that Matt and I explore as we try and wrap our heads around this ongoing parody of an election that is guaranteed to piss off one half of the country and further radicalize and polarize an already outraged electorate. I've been saying this since the very beginning of the coronavirus outbreak. Coronavirus is not the existential threat that we should be concerned about. The polarization in our communities and in our country is, if it means we can't effectively govern ourselves or hold a free and fair election, whose outcome the vast majority of Americans can trust. We have enemies, both foreign and domestic, who would love nothing more than to further divide us. And so far, we have fallen directly into that trap. I have absolutely no idea what the next few months will hold, but I implore everyone listening today to think twice before acting on your impulses and emotions. We need calm. The anger and unrest in this country could easily spiral out of control, and I don't think any of us are prepared for what something like that will actually look like. We are all accountable, and we all need to hold ourselves accountable. In a democracy, there is no one else. A quick note for anyone who is new to Hidden Forces. We don't accept commercial sponsors. These conversations last anywhere between 90 minutes to two hours, the second half of which is made available to our premium subscribers, along with transcripts to each conversation, as well as notes in the form of rundowns that I put together ahead of each and every episode. If you value what we do, consider signing up for one of our four content tiers. If that's not an option for you, there are still things you can do to support the show by sharing your enthusiasm and love for the podcast. Tweet it out, send it to your friends, and write us a review on Apple Podcasts. 
Every bit of support helps, especially in a climate like this, where independent voices are needed and where we face significant resistance in breaking through the noise of partisan rancor and disinformation that has only been amplified by this most recent election. And on that note, please enjoy this week's conversation with my guest, Matt Taibbi. Matt Taibbi, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks for having me on, Dimitri. Long time. Yeah, it's been, uh, how long has it been? A couple like, of years, uh, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think both campaigns have conspired against us on this morning. <laughs> Shenanigans. Yeah. Yeah, we had a we had a really tough time setting that up. For listeners, we also may have a mystery guest joining us later. We'll see. Uh, uh there's a lot of technical issues going on. Matt, I don't think I've actually ever seen the back of this uh, part of your room. <laughs> this is new. So I, I lot... moved I moved to this place, so. Yeah, it's yeah. nice. And yeah, that's thanks. the that's the cover of which book was that on the on the right? That's the cover uh, of one of your That's the divide. Previous... Uh, it's right, a pa- divide. painting by Molly Crabapple. Yeah. Right. It's the only piece of art I own. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, last time you were on the show, I don't know if you remember this, but we talked about your experience covering the Republican primary and actually Trump in particular, mm-hmm. and how you actually thought that he had a much better chance of winning than your colleagues did, but you kind of got suckered into I did. going a- along with them. Yeah. And you said, I think you said, I tried to find the transcript, but it was in the it was must have been in the overtime. I think you said that you would never let that happen your, to you again. And I, and I I did let it happen again. <laughs> mm-hmm. So what happened? What were your expectations this time around with the election? Well, I thought Trump would do a lot better, and some of the things that I thought were worth pointing out, and I wrote about this actually a couple of times. One thing that was really important was that Trump went into the 2016 election day with a lot of ambivalence among Republican voters about him. I mean, I think his his approval rating, he had a tough time creeping over a 60% approval rating throughout most of that election year. And if you remember correctly, 19% of the voters who cast votes, this is according to exit polls in 2016, disapproved of both candidates. And Trump did really well with, with those folks. But four years since, Trump really consolidated his support among Republicans. So he kind of entered this election cycle with the profile of a typical Republican incumbent with approval ratings that hovered somewhere between 85 and 95 percent among Republicans, which I think is important because incumbents usually don't lose. And he had basically the same profile as like a George Bush in 2004. So I I wrote about that stuff a lot. And yet I fell for the same the same stuff over the summer because I kept seeing poll numbers that that looked like it was just not possible for there to be that many hidden voters. And I also heard repeatedly from pollsters who I talked to that, oh, we've changed our our techniques and we're not going to miss that stuff anymore. And we we know what we're looking for and we're never going to let that mistake happen again. And it happened again. It's just unbelievable. And I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed, frankly, because I participated in a, a little bit in the mirage that this was a done deal. Well, so a natural question is, because you would have expected them to make changes, did they make changes? Were those changes ineffective in practice because of anomalies specific to this race? I mean, why were the polls so off? Because the extent of the divergence is enormous. Yeah. I mean, look at Ohio. They were predicting a five-point loss for Trump in Ohio. And what did he end up with? Like an eight-point win? Something like that, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, a 12-point swing is is pretty massive. And yes, he lost the popular vote. Like if you look at the popular vote, that's almost reflective of, of where the polls were. But on a state-by-state basis, they were pretty significantly wrong in a lot of places and almost universally wrong in the same direction. There were a couple of outliers there. Mm -hmm. You know, I think maybe Arizona is a bit of an outliner. But to answer your question, I think there must be something inherently confusing or flawed in the polling process. And I always talk about it in terms of you can only get so much from yes or no answers from people, right? Like if you're actually covering a campaign and you talk to people and you can tell that like with every fiber of their being, 
they not only love their candidate, but despise the other candidate, that tends to be reflective of something, right? Like the people on that block, if you're not going to get a person who is so completely cut off from all the other people in his circle, his or her circle, that they believe this thing. So when you encounter that kind of enthusiasm, it tends to suggest that there's a lot of it out there. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what polls, the problem with polls is, is that they frame this as, as would you or wouldn't you? Yes or no. Hmm. And that doesn't do as much to detect what's actually happening as more subjective tests might reveal. I wonder also to what extent, and then we'll get off of this because this is more like wonky type of stuff, but I wonder to what degree Trump's rallies in the last few weeks, how that contributed to changing the dynamics on the ground. It certainly could have. And, and the Democratic candidate being absent you know, doesn't help either. I think, <laughs> you know, you know, but Biden essentially was a no show, which lent itself to some questions. I saw some people talking about how some elderly voters might have been a little freaked out about that because Trump really alienated elderly voters significantly this year with his coronavirus policies. But, you know, some of their trust in Biden might have been undermined by, you know, things that they're recognizing maybe from people in their own circle. Like, the guy's absent for nine days at a time and has trouble when he speaks in public, you know, maybe he is in decline. I think that did have an impact, probably, because Trump, he bounces back from COVID and he looks like he's like ready to go play an NBA game. And, you know, in a couple of weeks, it's it had to have an impact. Yeah, he's like the uh, Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going. So let's actually move our conversation to election night, Matt. First of all, you guys did your typical drinking game. I yeah. watched some of that. Did you... <laughs> So what is that? Do you do that every time there's any kind of election or is it just for presidential politics or you just do it generally? We do it sometimes for like debates and stuff like that, because what we're, what we're really usually trying to do and we didn't really do the game that much that night because we got wrapped up in the results. But normally you're watching something like a debate and the whole joke is that you're trying to predict what people say. So, you know, for a Democratic Party drinking game, if one of the rules is drink every time they say existential threat. You're going to take like five shots that night, yeah, you're right? Be because they wasted. say, yeah, exactly. So that that's the whole joke is, you know, it's predicting the stuff that you hear in political coverage. So we do that every now and then. So what's the lesson that we can draw so far? Like what have we learned early on in this election that we didn't know going into it? So I think the big thing is if you look at the down ballot results and you look at the shift in the demographics of Trump's support, which I thought were amazing. Like Trump did worse with white male voters and he did better with basically every other demographic. And if yeah. if the Republican Party is smart and there's there isn't necessarily evidence to suggest that they are, but if they are, they will see that the opening is there for them to market themselves as the working class party of the country, right? And alternatively to present the Democrats as the party of the rich elites, which mm -hmm. there's some validity to that, right? The Republicans under Trump expanded their support with Hispanic voters. They did pretty well with new immigrants. And the reasons for that are complicated, I think, but it's something I think it, it really highlights some bad decisions that the Democrats made last year to kind of devalue certain lines of argument that were being made by people like Sanders and Warren about class issues. Mm -hmm. They ran screaming from that. And as a result, they couldn't run on it with Biden. And that left an opening. And for a politician who is more clever, that could become a problem. And it's reflected in the down ballot stuff. Yeah. 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 So the numbers that I have here in front of me is that he gained pretty much one fifth of black male voters up from 13% in 2016. He doubled his support among, amongst black female voters. He doubled his support amongst LGBT people. And he gained in terms of Latinos and Asians. And I wonder, you know, when I saw that, I thought, well, this is like one of those like Thomas Kuhn paradigm <laughs> shift moments. You know, it's like you've got this theory and it's clearly not working. You know, all the empirical data is telling you that you need to change your entire theoretical framework for how you see the world. And yet I wonder if the Democrats are actually going to do that. There was this incredibly tone deaf op-ed that I read a couple days ago or yesterday, maybe, 
by Charles Blow at the New York Times. And he basically, what he did was he looked at the data and he said, this is further evidence for just how entrenched the patriarchy is that minorities and and uh, marginalized groups would actually vote in greater numbers for their oppressor. Right. Yeah. And the problem, I think, to anybody who doesn't live in that bubble is that language itself. You know, I don't give Trump credit for anything affirmatively that he did to win those votes. I think that a lot of a lot of that voting behavior comes from probably apprehension about trends in academic thought that, you know, sort of portray minorities as terminal victims, as people who are whose success or failure is 100 percent dependent upon the indulgence of a patriarchal white supremacist class. I think a lot of people in those groups don't see themselves in that light and they resent it. And, you know, for me, frankly, I think it's a racist caricature a little bit. And it's kind of like an inverted version of the old Republican argument. Actually, it's not even that old. Like Donald Trump Jr. was just making it that, you know, you have to want success as much as we do in order to get it. Like, basically what they're saying is that, you know, we're successful because, you know, we've earned it and you aren't successful because you haven't earned it. But the democratic rhetoric is kind of like a, it's a flip of that. It's like, you only succeed because we allow it, you know, and you don't succeed because we don't allow it. That's not an attractive theory, I don't think. But you're right. They're going to double down on it rather than So you think they're going to double down on it? Because I I was actually wondering if one of the positive outcomes that will come from this is that there will be a re-examination and a reckoning within the Democratic Party. You don't think so? You're shaking your head. There should have been one four years ago about a lot of stuff, like starting with the Democratic platform and maybe continuing on to how the media looks at politics. But remember, one of the early conclusions of both the political class and the kind of attendant big corporate media was that the only reason that Donald Trump won was because of racism. Basically, they took the Hillary Clinton's deplorables comment and they expanded it to no longer cover just a third of Trump's voters, but all of them. And now this became the de facto go to explanation for Trump's entire base. And these results should tell them that that was a flawed construction because clearly minorities themselves did not see it that way. And and yet they're not going to, I really doubt they're going to do that because that would mean re-examining past errors, which they just don't like to do. You know, I mean, it, it's one of the things that we found out in the last four years is that they just tend not to want to go back and say, we screwed this up and there's no way to address it without without doing that. So let's game out a few scenarios here. First of all, what is going on right now with the vote counting? Because I've been confused by this as well. I'm confused about what Trump is alleging, what he wants, because on the one hand, he wants he wanted vote counting to continue. So he did. He wanted them to finish voting, but now he wants voting to stop. Where are we with this? I don't really. I mean, and I have to admit, I've never really covered a vote counting story and I'm not really good on the mechanics of how it all works. But I I think what Trump is alleging, what their people are saying is that we want to have access to watching the process of counting votes. And they want also to stop any new voting that would take place. But there also clearly are people who are gathering outside of some voting places screaming for people to stop counting. So I'm a little confused about what exactly is going on. This is a disaster. It's really a disaster. Well, sure. I mean, it raises all kinds of questions about the legitimacy of the processes because, and you know, you couple this with the sort of rampant dishonesty of the press in the last four years, it's just going to make people suspicious of the results. I personally don't necessarily think that way, but people are going to come away with this, with questions about what happened on election night. Well, I don't think of myself as a conspiracy theorist. In fact, I go out of my way not to do that. And a good example is even the the Jeffrey Epstein situation. I I didn't jump out and start saying what I thought happened or didn't happen. I wasn't in the cell with him. But I, I've been amazed even with myself 
what I've been willing to entertain in the situation. I want to take a quote from a friend of yours, Glenn Greenwald, who wrote, no matter what the final result, there will be substantial doubts about its legitimacy by one side or the other, perhaps both. And no deranged conspiracy thinking is required for that. An electoral system suffused with this much chaos, error, protracted outcomes, and seemingly inexplicable reversals will sow doubt and distrust even among the most rational citizens. I feel like that's a pretty good description of where we are today. It's such a disaster. And I wonder if it's just that our expectations are too high or, you know, in the words of Crystal Ball, who was on your show recently, why can't we have nice things anymore? <laughs> well, for so long, we didn't really have an issue with this because the the possibility of, well, that's not true. I mean, we, we clearly had significant vote fraud in some pretty famous elections, 1960, the Kennedy's election in 1960 being a famous one. But we don't have a uniform national vote counting system. So inevitably, what ends up happening is that collecting all the results comes down to you know, a confederacy of different state systems that all have their own idiosyncrasies. And we saw this very clearly with the disaster in Iowa, and I was there for that. You know, when they didn't have a clear result, they were sort of just making up the rules as they went along. And there were people who would come up and they would be spokespersons for the state who would say one thing, and then you would hear a completely different explanation from some other person in the government, you know, a few minutes later, and you would find that certain counties behaved one way and other counties behaved in other ways. And that's just not sustainable. If, if that's the case for across an entire country of 350 million people, then clearly you're going to get problems. And that's before you even get to the question of whether there's corruption, which is, of course, totally possible. <laughs> so, yeah, and then people are going to doubt the results. You know, like just to take Wisconsin, for example, what's a Republican supposed to think when they go to bed you know, looking at the map and seeing that it looks like they've got it in the bag and they wake up the next morning and they see like within a minute, the whole picture has been reversed it's almost certainly legit because if you're just taking all votes from Milwaukee, that makes some sense. But like, I don't know. People are going to, they're going to wonder about it. They just will. Well, I, yeah. And we, we knew this. This is the other thing that's really difficult to wrap your head around because we understood that there was going to be a huge number of mail-in ballots and that those mail-in ballots were, were going to be counted in the days afterwards. Why exactly that's the case, I'm not sure. But of course, I mean, Mart Barton Gelman wrote this really great analysis and and projection for The Atlantic where he talked about, he basically gamed out this exact scenario that Trump would come out and say that he won the election, which is exactly what he did. And now lots of people, regardless of what's going to happen, are going to doubt the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the frustrating thing is there were clearly some states that were more experienced with election night shenanigans took the time to make sure that they had a lot of this locked down before election night. So Florida didn't have problems and they were able to report their results in a timely fashion despite having historic numbers of mail-in ballots, but other states just decided not to go that route. And, you know, they were releasing results piecemeal and, and kind of making up when they're going to release results on the fly. And like, what is that? Why why do it that way? You know, hmm. there should have been, I just do not understand saying, let's take a break and reconvene at five o'clock tomorrow evening to start counting again. Like that, that makes zero sense to me in a situation like this. Yeah, it does. It makes you wonder whether they do it on purpose. Sure. And, and you combine that with the press decisions that seem completely subjective about when they call certain states and, and when they don't. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure I grasp that either because you know they're, they're called New York with zero percent of the vote in basically and I understand that because there's no way New York is going to go for Trump but that's based on prior voting patterns and as we saw you know during this election prior voting patterns didn't hold in a lot of places and in some cases they were pretty significant so why are we waiting to call Alaska when X amount of the vote is already in and it's clear it's not going to be close, but we are calling it in other places. Like, I, I don't I don't get that either. I don't know. Some of it doesn't make sense, even to me. And yeah. I work in the media, you know, uh, so. Yeah. So let's 
I mean, this is conjecture, and and I like I said, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but this election, this election has made me more of a conspiracy theorist, just like the 2008 financial crisis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it really has. Not as much because with the, the financial crisis, you could actually see people doing it out, out in public. It was more flagrant. But I mean, is Biden going to win this thing? Is that what, it, what it's looking like right now? I should say we're recording this on Thursday, noon, Thursday, November 5th. So the most likely scenario is Biden retains one or both of uh, Arizona and Nevada, that coupled with him winning Wisconsin and Michigan gives him the election. If he wins Nevada and it's just Wisconsin, I think it comes out to be exactly 270. The only scenario for Trump that seems like that has a chance of working is if he flips Arizona and then doesn't lose Pennsylvania. So then at that point, Biden doesn't get the 270, I think. And then we're talking about Trump winning. But that doesn't sound likely to me. Mm. So, and it, you know, who knows? But it, the traditional people who who are usually authoritative about these things, they that sound extremely confident. Wrong. Yeah, but no, but they sound extremely confident that yeah. they're at least going to get a result that is favorable to them in Pennsylvania. So, you know. I wonder if we'll ever stop taking official numbers for granted because it just gives us a false sense of security and certainty and we need that in order to operate our brains. But I, I firmly believe that, by the way, I, that, yeah. that, that, that's important. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> covered Wall Street, so you would know that for sure. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's actually, for the purposes of speculation, let's assume that Biden wins. Mm -hmm. It also doesn't seem clear yet whether the Republicans are going to retain the Senate. Everyone says that they are. But I know that David Perdue's race against John Ossoff in Georgia potentially could flip. And that's kind of the pathway that the Democrats have. But let's assume that the, that the Republicans get the Senate. So which means we're going to enter into a period of divided government, that's for sure. I wonder to, how that's going to impact Biden's agenda. I also wonder to what degree they may welcome it, because it'll be a lot easier for them not to be held accountable for their promises. <laughs> and to sort of, you know, keep the the base of the Democratic Party, the real base, which I think diverges from their template, at bay. I wonder what implication this is going to have for Nancy Pelosi. So, I, you know, I'm curious, what are your thoughts? Let's say we have Biden in the executive, the Democrats control the Congress, albeit having lost, I think, seven seats or something like that net, and the Republicans retaining the Senate. I mean, I think it's a perfect scenario for the Democrats because it absolves them of the responsibility to, to do any of the difficult kinds of governing that, that they're ostensible base wants of them while they'll be able to seamlessly continue doing the things that they've always really wanted to do, like enhance the military budget, go to war in places, make sure that corporate tax loopholes aren't closed, you know, deliver bailouts. They'll have plenty of juice to get all those things done, but it's things like, you know, canceling student debt or ending, uh, you know, taking antitrust action against tech monopolies. Like that's the kind of stuff that just, they will not even have to answer questions about thinking of doing as long as they don't have the Senate. So, you know, for me personally, I, I always thought people like Nancy Pelosi were much better or more comfortable in the position that she's been in, which is, you know, being in opposition that doesn't really have to oppose anything or do anything. You know, I mean, it's performative and they're good at that. Well, I mean, about the tech platforms, I should say what our mystery guest was supposed to be Matt Stoller, but because of some technical issues we've had here, that may that may not happen. But I had I had written out some questions for Matt that I wanted us to discuss, the three of us, and one of them had to do with the tech platforms. Well, first of all, that raised an important point, which is that Facebook and Twitter in particular featured prominently in this election with suppression of news. When Trump came out and said he won the election, Twitter censored that tweet. And I also saw a bunch of other, I have some screenshots of censoring both Democrat and Republican. Yeah, um, Nira, Nira Tandon got censored. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I forget. She said something like the president, the Biden is winning Michigan or something like that, and she got censored. Mm -hmm. That's so freaky to me, man, mm -hmm. that we have private corporations running public squares, the primary 
spaces where we we come to political consensus and they are making decisions about what to allow and what not to allow. And their defenders say that they have every right to do that because they're a private company, rather than looking at the context, which is that they're a private company facilitating a public space. You know. Well, it's even worse than that, I would argue, because there are private companies that got called into the Hill after Trump got elected and overtly threatened with increased right regulation by people like Senator Mark Warner, Maisie Hirono, Hawaii. And basically these companies were told, most of these companies had long histories of not wanting to be in the fact checking or political content moderation game. You know, Mark Zuckerberg, right before the 2016 election, was saying like, we're not a news organization, we're a tech company, right? And then they get hauled in by the Senate, they get ordered, where is your plan for preventing the fomenting of discord? That's the phrase that they use. Told that if they don't do that, there's gonna be tax penalties and all kinds of other things. They suddenly have to enter into partnerships with the FBI and groups like the Atlantic Council. The FBI calls them private sector partnerships now. So they're being advised on what is and is not fake news by groups full of former intelligence officials and big corporate donors and overseas partisans donors like and partisan yeah, officials. Yeah, partisan officials. And suddenly they're, you know, like mad interfering in the publication of private news media. I think that's a clear First Amendment issue. It's not just private companies acting on their own accord. This is this is a partnership that has to be understood that way. So where does this lead us? I do want to bring us back to some of the issues around governance, but let's stay with this a bit. Where do you think this takes us? Is this going to become a more permanent feature of our social landscape like surveillance did after 9-11? Yeah, I think so. And this was the reason that I had such, I struggled with the, even the possibility of voting for the Democrats is because I think that this is going to lead to a, essentially an ongoing kind of quasi-censorship regime. Because remember, they could have gone a couple of ways with these tech companies. Like they could have insisted on breaking up their monopolistic control of news distribution, which would have limited pretty significantly the possibility of spreading both foreign misinformation and fake news and all that stuff. But they didn't do that. They they specifically kept the you know this kind of oligopoly of tech firms in place, and they're all imposing rules that are completely subjective and clearly kind of go in the direction of, we're going to use the standard of what would the Washington Post consider real news as what we're going to censor and not censor. And the problem is those companies, those traditional arbiters of a fact and authorities have their own political views. I mean, the, the other day, I wrote an article where I was going to talk about why I didn't want to vote for either party in this election. And I thought about the headline and the headline was going to be vote for neither. But I knew that that would actually trigger Twitter's policy against discouraging people from voting. So I had to change the headline. Do you think that really would have triggered that? Yeah, no, I know. I know exactly. I've, I've spoken to the people at the company about what their rules are in terms of why they step in. Like they have a, one of the one of the things they are big into is uh, any news that suggests that people not take real precautions during the pandemic. Another one had it was anything that that encouraged people not to vote or gave them false reasons not to vote. Like a classic example would be a news item that told them that a certain polling place was closed. Now, I didn't think that my stance fell into that category, but I could see it being misinterpreted that way. So Clearly I not because off. it's your opinion. Clearly it's my opinion, but but that's the problem is that we're living in this environment where people are going to have to start weighing stuff like that and what people are going to back off from the line because they don't want to be taken off these platforms. So you know? what does that mean for people like you and me, and especially you, because you're like one of the most opinionated journalists that I follow. So what, what how does this impact our work? I think it's significant because in, when Alex Jones first got kicked off, the first thing I thought of was, you know, all of these kind of hashtag resistance, quote unquote, liberals who are cheering because 
you know, ding dong, the witch is dead. We finally got rid of this horrible person. But what they're not thinking of is we just replaced one system of speech regulation, you know, that had been built up over hundreds of years. I mean, it took forever to get us to this place where, you know, the courts decided issues like libel and slander and that sort of stuff. It was a flawed system, but it was a pretty good system. It worked, right? And we just changed it in a heartbeat for a new one that where corporate tech overlords who are not accountable, not elected, not transparent, make decisions basically, you know, behind closed doors about who gets to be distributed and who doesn't. And everybody loves that. And right away, you could see what the end game of that is. That it's going to start with Alex Jones, and they're going to slowly move in the borders to start mm. including other people. And then they're going to take on not just people, but themes like QAnon, right? Yeah. And then they're going to, they, they, even within QAnon, they expanded the definition of what of what was impermissible there. They started off with encouraging violence and then they did then they expanded it into some anything that was tied to real world harm which is like a, an impossibly vague standard so you know for people like me let's say that i have an opinion that the new york post story that they that they ran about hunter biden that i don't think it should be censored and that i think it's a legitimate news story in some way like i could see myself being bounced from these platforms, even if I'm not saying that I believe the story or think it's that important, you know, other journalists, and I've talked about this with other journalists, we all worry about it now. Yeah. Well, ironically, those of us who thought that it was a bad idea for Alex Jones to be taken off of YouTube, I was one of those people. I think many people, a fraction of of people, in the, but a vocal minority of people saw that as a kind of closet fascism, mm -hmm. ironically. Not that YouTube's actions were somehow fascist, but that those of us who were opposed to that, and, I, and, it, and the same would be true with the Hunter Biden story. I stayed away from that story. I didn't have the nerve to even get involved in it because of all the pretenses associated with it. But it, it was another example of something where like, it was clearly newsworthy, and yet no one wanted to touch it. Yeah, I did the same thing. So I, I did a whole big thing on it, like on the media response to it. And then I went back through all the publicly available things that were known about it. And then I also did some additional reporting, talking to people in Ukraine. But I didn't touch any of the stuff that was actually in the emails, because I wanted to say, here's what we know for sure before we get into the issue of what they're reporting. Right? Yeah. But just to do that, people will say, okay, you're you're a closet Trumper, or you're doing this because you love Trump. And, and it's not that. It's that you. What, what worries me is the idea of suppressing a legitimate news story because, like, once they do that once, they're going to just keep narrowing the parameters until you know. Finally, they're going to make the argument that anything that isn't, you know, within the lane of kind of mainstream milk toast CNN reportability is like somehow illegitimate. Every time they make the argument that this is that something is foreign dis disinformation. They also narrow the parameters because they can always subjectively argue that X, Y, or Z content aids, you know, Putin or some other foreign actor in helping sow discord or whatever or whatever it is. So, like, I'm afraid of these standards because they can easily be applied to people like you or me. Yeah. So, I mean, to that effect, do you see. Because Stoller, like I said, he was supposed to come on, and I read some of his more recent stuff, and he's more optimistic on a Biden administration than I would have expected. And I think there are reasons for that. One of them, I think, has to do with what he thinks Biden's ideology is versus his voting record, which expresses his pragmatism as a representative of Delaware. But do you think that because this is such a unifying bipartisan issue, just like China, for example... Do you think that this is something Republicans and Democrats can come together on in the next four years where we might actually see some hearings to address some of the stuff that came out of the Cicilline report? Uh, what report? The House Antitrust Subcommittee chaired by Congressman Cicilline, which recently came out with its report on large technology platforms. Oh, right. Yes. The one that concluded that Facebook and all those companies were, they fit the definition of monopolies, right? Yeah, exactly. So I doubt it. This is my primary worry, and I, I, I think your Matt Stoller is probably right in his assessment of what Biden's actual political leanings are. 
but he played along. I didn't, you know, I didn't hear him com complaining about any of these big changes that were taking place in the last year. And, you know, he piled on with all the rest of them when, when uh, there was all this talk of, you know, foreign subversion involving, you know, other people on the ticket. Hmm. So, yeah, that's what worries me. I mean, I think the Republicans are going to focus on something that is harder to prove, which is that the the new changes in, in the informational landscape are designed specifically to suppress conservative thought, which I don't think is exactly right. I think it's much more that they're looking to try to eliminate speech kind of across the spectrum, you know, mm -hmm. including, you know, the, like Jacobin got locked out of its account for a couple of things, you know, before the election. Satire, like, you know, the Babylon Bee, obviously that's conservative. They've had some issues, but sites like the World Socialist website, in those, in some of those hearings, like Google essentially admitted that it had been criticized for deranking the World Socialist website. So I don't think that there's going to be any bipartisan energy that's going to get together to, you know, help prevent the next phasing out of QAnon or the World Socialist website. Like I see that as being opposite to what the kind of bipartisan consensus would do. I bet they are going to come together to make sure no one like Trump ever gets elected again. Well, uh, yeah, that's very possible, right? Or maybe not, because, you know, what's interesting is that this new version of the Democratic Party that so enthusiastically welcomed in the kind of Lincoln Project type Republican and David Frum and Bill Kristol, all those neocons, like, where's the room that's left for the Republican Party? If they're smart, again, they will lean into the whole populist angle that, that Trump turned out to be kind of a phony at, but you know, they will, they will lean into the class aspect of it and, you know, and find somebody who can play that role a little bit better. So I, I don't know. I, I, I worry that the, the Democrats are essentially going to become like the representative of the old two party state and, you know, and the, and the Republicans are going to have to re reinvent themselves as something else. That's interesting because I was actually – so th these are a few of the questions I, that I, I want to ask you, but we're going to move it into the overtime for it, Matt. But one of them is what does a post-Trump Republican Party look like? First of all, what's going to happen to Trump? That's a really open question. Is he going to be indicted? Is he going to be prosecuted for anything? Is he going to be pardoned by a Biden administration? Is he going to go and start a media company? Is he going to be basically like a political leader in exile because we're kind of like a banana republic? So he's going to be like out in a, in a third country agitating. I also feel like the real future of the Democratic Party is a far more populist, as you've pointed out, socialist type party. And people that, that are aligned with that vision are people like AOC and Bernie and others. And AOC really knows how to use social media. I mean, she is like made for this time. So I want to ask you about that. I also wonder what's going to happen to Nancy Pelosi. Is she going to survive the next four years? But I'm going to save those and other questions for the overtime, Matt. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of my conversation with Matt, as well as the transcripts and rundowns to this episode and every other episode we've ever done, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces. There's also a link in the summary page to this episode with instructions on how to connect the overtime feed to your phone so that you can listen to these extra discussions just like you listen to the regular podcast. Matt, stick around. We're going to move the second part of our conversation into the subscriber overtime. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. 
Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. We'll be right back.